shall we Devi sir shall we start yes sir yes can you hear me uh, now yes okay yes uh, good afternoon uh, everyone uh, we are really happy to see you all for this uh, first uh, webinar of tusad uh, ncpr uh, center for uh, polar sciences the very objective is to promote uh, polar related science among the academic community and research community we, so we, yes yeah now um yes i think it's all muted and we have a lot of participants uh, waiting in our youtube live streaming it is there uh, already 50 people are there in the youtube uh, uh, this thing uh, live streaming and uh, my officially i have to just invite because i just have 2 uh, minutes time so i'm uh, honorable uh, uh, director of ncpr dr m ravichandran and the speaker of the day professor dr martin lunen from groningen university and uh, we have a guest from arctic migratory bird initiative amb dr martin ecker is an advice and uh, the representative of norway in amb uh dr rahul mohan dr kp krishnan dr sunil and all those who are uh, watching uh, this program listening to this program i extend all of you a very warm welcome uh, to this uh, wonderful lecture going to be delivered by uh, professor martin i now invite uh, dr m ravichandran uh, for the introductory remarks thank you very good afternoon and good morning to all Uh, it is very great pleasure to welcome you all to the CUSAT NCPUR Center for Polar Science webinar series. As you all know that this center was established in July last year to develop capacity building, training and research in polar sciences in India. Under this joint center, it is planned the university students to come to National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, and they can do their dissertations, as well as university faculties to come to NCPUR and do their research, especially during their vacation or whenever get the, they get the opportunity. And also, scientists from NCPUR can also visit university or teach remotely to the students, and some of the students from NCPUR can also register for their PhD in QSAT. i am sure in the coming years we will have more research and collaborative campaign opportunities in the arctic antarctic himalaya and southern ocean so this is the first time kusat ncpr center of polar science is organizing a polar science webinar series and i am glad that dr martin lunen university of groningen netherland has kindly agreed to deliver the first webinar talk on how do we barnacle goose cope up with the changing environment thank you dr lunen for agreeing to deliver your talk today i am sure it will be beneficial to many of us and especially young students and researchers thank you all for joining this event i i hand over that to maybe the next yes now i invite uh, dr morten ecker Uh, he is advisor uh, at the Norwegian uh, Environmental Agency, as well as uh, he is the Norway's representative of uh, uh, AMBI, which is actually a lot of prospects for uh, collaborative research with AMBI, the Malaysian Central Asian Flyway, and the migratory birds. Lots of them reaching uh, this part of the world, and a uh, lot of them flying from here to other places. So there's a uh, great scope for uh, collaboration. I invite. Uh, Dr. Morten Ecker to give a brief about uh, you know AMB and its initiatives and also welcoming uh, maybe uh, I mean uh, Professor Martin. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, the Arctic Migratory Birds Initiative uh, welcomes the invitation to participate in today's webinar hosted by the National Center for Polar Sciences. Uh, as you said, my name is Morten Ecker, uh, and in my capacity as the senior advisor in the Norwegian Environment Agency, I represent the government of Norway uh, to the Arctic Migratory Birds Initiative, or AMBI. 
AMBI is a project under the conservation of Arctic flora and fauna, uh, the biodiversity working group of the Arctic Council. It focuses on uh, actions to support sustainable populations of Arctic breeding birds currently in decline, which through their migration pathways connect the Arctic to other areas of the world, including uh, India. Many of these species, such as the curly sandpiper, spoonbill sandpiper, great knot, red knot, dunlin, bar-tailed godwit, and others, are experiencing alarming population declines across the world. Depending on the geography, some populations have declined anywhere from uh, 50 to 90 percent in the last few decades. India, as an observer state to the Arctic Council, is an important partner in AMBI. The Central Asian Flyway for birds that breed in the Arctic is the least well-known flyway in terms of status and trends and is experiencing a lot of data gaps, especially when it comes to wader species. Given this, there are many opportunities where India and AMBI can work together to increase understanding of these species. These species. India has uh, been uh, a valuable partner already. India's National Action Plan for the Central Asian Flyway shortlists several AMBI priority species for the formulation of single species action plans and many wetland and coastal sites uh, of importance for AMBI species in India, such as Point Calimere, Pulikat Lake, uh, Chilika Lake and uh, Sunderbans, just to name a few, are recognized in the, in the action plan. My colleagues, uh, Dr. Evgeny Sidoskovsky, uh, the AMBI chair from Russia, and Courtney Price, the AMBI global coordinator from the CAF Secretariat, uh, had the pleasure to, of an, uh, attending two recent meetings in India. The first, the International Conference on Wetlands and Migratory Waterbirds in, uh, of the Asian Flyways, uh, was in November 2019 in Lonavala, and they were joined by uh, Dr. Krishnan of the NCPOR, um, afterwards, Evgeny and Courtney met the Secretary Dr. Ravi Chandran and uh, Dr. Kumar at the Ministry of Earth uh, Sciences, as well as other colleagues at the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change in New Delhi. Uh, just a few months later, in February 2020, Evgeny and Courtney were uh, joined by Dr. Mark Marisink, the current capture at the Convention of the Migratory Species in Gandhi Nagar. Uh, these meetings were invaluable to connect AMBI with relevant Indian organizations in polar science and migratory bird work and were instrumental to further discussions on cooperation. So discussions that were started uh, there are continuing today, uh, in particular uh, on a tagging, surveying and expert exchange project that would uh, help fulfill mutual goals in AMBI and the Central Asian Flyway Initiative. Uh, AMBI remains committed to cooperating with our Indian partners to advance uh, AMBI's uh, implementation in the Central Asian Flyway and to support appropriate activities of India's Central Asian Flyway Initiative. So again, uh, thank you to Dr. Hata, Ravi Chandran, Dr. Mohan, Sunil, and Dr. Krishnan for the opportunity uh, for AMBI to be present here. And uh, I wish uh, Dr. Martin Lunen, who is a friend and also involved in AMBI, good luck with his lecture. Thank you. You're muted, uh, Hatha. Yeah, I, now I invite uh, uh, Dr. Rahul to introduce our speaker, Martin Lonen. Well, uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Martin Ecker, for uh, giving an insight into the migratory birds and on AMBI, and also putting a line for the speaker for today. So it's my privilege and honor to introduce the speaker for today, Professor Martin Lonen. Uh, Martin Lonen is a polar researcher and is an associate professor at the Arctic Center of the University of Groningen. Uh, Groningen is a town which is in the northern or northeastern part of Amsterdam. Uh, he's a biologist uh, who has been traveling to Spitsbergen for 
maybe more than 25 years. Exactly. And uh, he's studying the behavior of migratory birds and the changes in their living condition. His focus has been on the goose, I would say geese ecological studies since 1982. And uh, it will be of interest to many who are listening today that as an ecologist, uh, he has focused on all trophic levels, uh, which involves, uh, which is involved from microbial to botanical, immunological, behavioral, predator, and of course, modeling studies as well. Right. Uh, also interesting to note is that he took initiatives to tag the Arctic turn, uh, which we all know uh, travels either ways. So long distances with geolocators to understand uh, migratory processes. Martin is at the moment the chairman of the Nee Allison Science Managers Committee in ISMAC and a member of SIOS and also represents Netherlands in CAF, which is a biodiversity working group of the Arctic Council. Of course, he's very popular uh, to whomever I've talked to and they say that, yes, he, he explains to you the warming in Arctic in great detail and he's reachable. <coughs> yeah, he's an, uh, a prolific outreach expert, I would say, <laughs> on social media platforms. And uh, he's keen to inform people about the gross changes that are happening in Arctic. And with these words, I welcome Dr. Martin to give his talk today. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honored to have this opportunity and I'll just make sure that I start my presentation. So it takes a few seconds. I hope you can see it now. So the um, my talk will be about how do barnacle geese cope with the changing environment. And I'm working at the Arctic Center, as we call it, of the University of Groningen. Um, I'm working in, on Svalbard since 1989. Uh, but uh, in the years it became uh, a little bit, my operation became the Netherlands Arctic Station. And we are a kind of partner station because, of course, we, uh, there are many countries which have stations in the Alasund. Also, the Himadri station of um, India is a very famous one there. I did a lot of different studies on the barnacle geese. I'll tell you a little bit more of some of them. But basically, I've studied behavior, physiology and the population size of barnacle geese. Uh, I studied the uh, effect on the vegetation, also experimentally with warming and grazing variables. I studied predation, which is um, uh, just by observ observing. I studied the health and the immune system of the geese by taking a blood sample. I looked at parasites. This is a picture of a nest flea which is actually taking blood of the incubating female and then deposits the blood on the eggs and the eggs get really bad. And it has also some consequences for the hatching success. And we studied the effect of pollution in an experiment with small captive uh, goslings. And finally, of course, it has been, there has been happening a lot. Uh, Svalbard is on, in one of the most uh, warming places on earth. Uh, it is uh, so climate change became a very important topic uh, over the years I've been studying. So just a little bit what I'm doing with my field work. I come in uh, around the moment when the eggs are almost close to hatching and we check the, the nests and the number of eggs. And there was one famous uh, female green papa alpha PA which you might see uh, underneath, which even didn't want to leave the nest. She knew me so well that she just kept sitting. But I'm counting the number of nests. I'm in identifying the rings. And so I, I try to have uh, a lot of data on who's nesting and what they are doing. But the important moment is when they hatch. So uh, th that's all noted. And then we start to follow the geese during the rest of the season because they move from the breeding islands 
to lakes, and this is a lake in, in the town I'm working in, the Alessund, where you can see the small families, and here even you can see uh, uh, yellow rings in the middle front and on the right side of the keys. And with a telescope, we can identify them and we can follow how many goslings they have and what they are doing. So one of the important things which is very relevant is that the, well, the goslings, the young ones can't fly, the parents also already start to molt. That's a strategy which is an adaptation to the short summer season in the Arctic, because then uh, the parents can fly again when the young can fly and they can start migration. Um, if they, in, you know, most birds uh, do the wing molt after the breeding season, but in geese and ducks, they do it during uh, the breeding season. And the geese lose all the big primaries at once and then they start growing. So you see in both sides of the wing, you see the growing primaries now, which are now something like 10 centimeters and need to be 28 centimeters before the goose can uh, take migration again. Oh, so what's happening? The geese stay close to these lakes on the, on the moss bank, where there is actually in the beginning of the season a lot of grass growing. But so they eat there and they produce a dropping every uh, every 10 minutes. It's a constant, they take about 100 bites per, sec per minute and they produce droppings all all way. I'll tell a little bit late, uh, later something more about it. But it means that there are a lot of droppings in this moss bank and some of the nutrients are floating into the lake. And so the first point where I want to put a little bit science in is actually a measurements we did in different lake systems. We compared different lakes. You have two goose species on Svalbard. It's the barnacle goose, which I'm uh, for, uh, studying, and the pink-footed goose. And they, they have big populations, but they don't like to be in the same lakes. So they have a to totally other strategy of using the land especially because the pink-footed goose is hunted and the barnacle goose is protected since 1980. So they are different goose species, but both of them produce droppings and in that they fertilize the lake with mainly phosphate. That means that the phytoplankton can grow on that. But in most cases, the phytoplankton is not increasing in biomass because we have the daphnia, the zooplankton, who eats all this extra production. And so the phytoplankton is kept low. But then in these shallow lakes, which freeze to the bottom, there's also a little predator. There are no fish because they freeze to the bottom, but there's a Lepidurus, this tadpole shrimp, it's called in English. Here you see it in the, in the bottle on the left, and they eat these Daphnia, as you can see in the middle picture. The interesting thing is that actually this tadpole shrimp is eaten by the barnacle geese, but not by the pink-footed geese. And that has a tremendous effect on lake systems if you start to compare the different lakes. This is actually a trophic cascade. The barnacle geese, who eats a lot of the tadpole shrimps, means that there are few left. That means that there are lots of Daphnia who have eaten all the phytoplankton, and then still there are nutrients left for the phytoplankton uh, so the nutrient level is higher. In lakes where the pink-footed goose is, all the nutrients end up in the Lepidurus. Large amount of Lepidurus, large amount of tadpole shrimps, but they have predated all the Daphnias, which means that the phytoplankton can really respond to the extra phosphorus and takes it all. So this is a beautiful example how while both geese are actually producing droppings, the system in the lake has a completely different structure and it's uh, managed from top down, a trophic cascade. I'm not just studying the lakes, I'm also studying the vegetation and especially the grasses, which the geese like to eat. I put a small ring, you can see on the right top side, you see a small ring around the chute and I go back every six days to measure the length of the leaves from uh, old, oldest to youngest. And so I built a history on production 
uh, and uh, senescence of these leaves. And this is very small scale and it's just very, very few plots. But on the other hand, this is exactly how a goose uses the grass. It's just picking leaf by leaf. And so I'm looking in the same scale. But to see what the good geese have done, actually they have removed almost all the grass in the, in the, uh, in the middle of the season. Here you see uh, the moss tundra. You don't see any grass here left. You see the droppings. So the geese have been eating all the grass. But if I place a small fence and I exclose the goose presence, then suddenly it starts to grow and I see uh, moss. This is not happening in one year, but something like after four to five years, it looks like this. And so you can see that there is a lot of grass available, but it's all eaten by the geese. And there are more vegetation changes. I have, so I have several of these exclosures, as I call them, but actually in these old exclosures, which are started in 2006, <coughs> the, uh, there's another species coming in, uh, um, uh, horsetail. Uh, Equisatum, and that species is not found in the Alessund anymore since 1994. So before 1994, it was growing there, but then the goose population was small. And we've seen in experiments that the geese love this horsetail. That's the preferred food type, but they've eaten it out everywhere. But if you have an exclosure, which is more than 15 years old, then suddenly it's completely covered by this Equisatum. So vegetation changes, uh, but not going very fast. But this is uh, pictures I got from uh, Fridtjof Melem, a uh, Norwegian researcher, who took these pictures and showed that even the vegetation had changed a lot. Here you can see Nialesund, there's the, the mast of uh, Nobile, of the Zeppelin, and it's also in the other picture to the right. So it's exactly the same spot. But all this grass, which is visible on the left side, which is actually not the preferred grass, but it has been removed by reindeer and geese on the right. So vegetation is changing a lot. We have to take that into account. We looked at pollution. This is just a little bit the graph about what we did with pollution. In the Alessund, in, there's, uh, it started as a mining town, a coal mine, and still in the uh, north of the village, there is a lot of residues of this old coal mine. And we did an experiment with captive goslings. And that is very nice to do because these goslings, if you raise them from the egg, then they think you're the mother. So these goslings were following us and we could just bring them to a site and let them graze over there. And that's what we, what we did. And we had a clean site close to the, uh, behind the airport actually. And we had a dirty site. You can see the coal on the ground. Uh, in the old coal mine. And the plants had more uh, um, more mercury in them. Uh, the geese had more mercury in them who were raged there, re, uh, raised there. But also the behavior of the uh, goslings changed. We did some tests. Uh, they were moving slower and they were earlier in panic two different things which were clearly significant. We did this experiment in two different years, and in both years it had the same results. So there is an effect of the pollution also for the animals who graze in those areas. So in the end of the season, we start catching the geese to have an idea on the growth of the goslings, but also to keep a ringed population with all these colorings. And they are easy to catch because they are more or less like sheep. You just put a net on. They can't fly at this moment. Uh, the one here in the in the middle in the pen, you can see the white lower back, which normally is covered by black feathers. Then it's not a molting, but if it's white, the feathers are gone and you see the white of the lower back. So we just bring them in uh, like we heard sheep and bring them into the net. This is another situation here. We brought the geese from the fjord and so they entered in this pen in the back. And now we are waiting for two hours because if I would start measuring them immediately, they are full with uh, grass and digesting it, which means that there's a lot of uh, feces produced. 
And so that would be a very dirty job. But the beauty of the barnacle geese is that they have a very fast in, uh, digestion from the mouth to going out in the back. It only takes one and a half hour. So we wait for two hours and then the geese are clean and we can just weigh them and measure them without getting dirty ourselves, but also not infecting the one goose with feces from the other. So this is the waiting period. And here you see I have a goose on my lap, which uh, I'm ringing, but also I just show how the wing mold is. You see the, the large secondaries below and the primaries in top, which are growing, and they grow seven millimeters a day. Just imagine that your nail or your hair would grow seven millimeters a day. I think you would be crazy after three days. But these animals, they know that the Arctic summer is short. They are adapted to the short summer in the Arctic. So they develop a tremendous fast growth speed. So this year we started even with some new data on, on uh, having a GPS collar on the geese which is shown here on the neck, so we know exactly where they go. And that's a new step in our research, which where I can't say any of the results yet, but it's we have now quite a lot of geese now, with, so we can follow them exactly with these GPS collars, which are sent to a radio, to a telephone system as soon as they are in reach from a telephone. So, and this is just a picture in the field. It's not a beautiful picture, but at least you can see it looked quite nicely. The geese were behaving well, and we really think we get a lot of more data on it. The collars were actually used to find back the geese because there is a project at the University of Vienna. I'm working together with people from Austria, and they want to look at hormone changes in the geese, and they want to collect droppings of the geese from uh, several moments during the day. So these two people are watching the geese, waiting until they see a dropping fall, and then they go into the field and collect specifically the dropping where it had been fallen. So they were using lots of telescopes. So as soon as they, were, they had a dropping, they kept the telescope pointing at that goose. Or the goose was gone, but the dropping was still there. So to understand a little bit what has happened, and that's why it's not only climate change, but actually um, I'm telling you why do geese migrate north? The, the geese from Svalbard, Spitsbergen is the Dutch name for Svalbard, the geese come from Scotland. They are on the north side of the Solway. They migrate in spring to the Helgelanden in middle Norway. Some of them go to Westerolen, more north, which is actually a recent development, something like 10 years. And then they fly to Svalbard. It's very difficult to time well, because if you are in Norway, you don't know what the weather is in Spitsbergen, and there is no correlation between the weather in those two sites. The same with Scotland and Norway. These weather systems are so different that you can't predict what's happening, you just have to go for it. So that's a very important uh, issue to remember. So what happened is actually the, the migration of the barnacle goose is a very old story. This is a, a picture of um, a book in the 17th century where the, the emperor of Austria had sent monks to Scotland to find out what was true about the story, that in summer there were mussels, and these mussels developed to geese in winter. They didn't know anything about the migration, and these monks did a lot of research, and they found within these mussels, they found these feathered structures, which actually, and they said, we even saw a small goose in one of the mussels, which is impossible. But at least they came back with evidence that it was the barnacle, that the, the, the story was right. That's also still why in England it's called the barnacle goose, because, <coughs> because these, these mussels are barnacles in English. That was the old story, and it was a science expedition, and I still like to tell this because we're doing science, and I hope that my stories hold a little bit longer than this story. But basically, what is uh, important for me to continue to understand why the geese go north is looking at the digestive tract. 
Here you have a digestive tract of a barnacle goose with a stomach, which is as big as a chicken egg. It has, uh, it's mainly muscle, but it grinds the grass in lower, in smaller parts. You must remember on top of that, there's the esophagus and the head with a bill, but they don't have teeth. So they just swallow the entire grass leaf. They grind it in the stomach and then it goes through a relatively short intestine and within one and a half hour, it leaves it on the other side again. It's compared with a reindeer. A reindeer has a very complex stomach system. It, it's a ruminant, so it can, it, it, uh, it, first of all, it has teeth in which it can grind, but also in the digestive process, it, it um, gets the grass from the stomach again in the mouth and makes it smaller, 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 and only the smallest parts are finally going in the intestine, which is extremely long. If the food is not digesting well, they have a blind sac, close to the end, and then it goes out of the reindeer. But then it has been in the intestine for almost two to three days, much longer. And that makes an interesting difference because no animal can digest cell walls. Cell walls are cellulose and cellulose is sugar, but bind it in a way that no animal can break this bond. The only thing which can break the bond is bacteria. And so these bacteria in the gut are really important and a symbiosis to break down the cellulose. It means that all the cellulose is broken down and used as sugar by the reindeer. While in the barnacle goose, all the cellulose is just coming out here in the back. So it's very nice. We can still see which plant they have been eaten by the epidermises of the, of the cell walls, which are in the dropping but also the goose can only digest the cell content, so which is much less. And that makes that, uh, that, that makes a big difference. And just to show you the point, actually it explains why the geese have to go north. Because in early spring, the grass has the highest protein content and the geese need to select the best grasses, spring grasses. And so they are in the winter areas and they move north when they uh, when the grass starts growing and it gets too low in protein, they move further north and they move to the Arctic tundra. Then there is snow over there. They lay the eggs, but when the young are born, there is uh, a high protein grass over there. So they really follow the green wave of spring grass. That's at least the reason for their migration. And to prove to you how important this, these small difference in digestion are, the reindeer, which graze in the Alessund on the moss area, actually they are not eating moss. They are not eating grass. They are eating goose droppings. And I show you in a series of pictures like this, where this male reindeer is just coming to this family who has been sitting here for half an hour. And so produced each produced three droppings. And these goslings, they are very selective in their foods. They need the best grasses but also each of them produces tree droppings. And the reindeer seems to feed over here, but he's just sniffing. He walks to the male, chases the male away, eats the droppings. Then he continues with his movement, moves to the goslings, chase them away, eats the droppings. So it's, uh, it's just showing how important these small differences is. And we did a nice experiment to test this we put droppings on the vegetation and we could easily see what were droppings of good grassy food, which were blackish and droppings of uh, mossy food, which were brownish. And we placed them in a square meter, almost exactly as you show on this slide, four squares, 25 droppings in each. And we left it for two days. And then we went back and looked what happened to the droppings. When on average in eight runs, 21 droppings of grass were taken and only one dropping of moss was taken by the reindeer. So the reindeer are very selective. They even know this difference of a goose which is eating moss and a goose which is eating grass. And they select only the grass droppings because they are better. So that kind of differences uh, uh, I, I use also to explain that these differences in protein content of spring grass is a reason for the which the geese follow to the north. 
Another nice, uh, 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 nice thing actually is that it's constant light. So they have a lot of opportunity to full feed, feed when they are there in summer on Svalbard. And they can have a, a, a rhythm of one half hour feeding, half an hour sleeping. That's how they spend the 24 hour day when the goslings are small. This means that they can digest the entire day. They are always full with grass and they are digesting and they just sleep half an hour and then they start eating again. They fill everything up and then they sleep and they still have uh, in that tract a lot of food to digest. Note also how nice these color rings. This is uh, green foxtrot papatango. How nice they uh, uh, are on the leg. And with a telescope, we can read them from a distance of 200 meters. So really nice. And then there are the predators. I told you before, the predators mainly in the, during the molting phase, it's the Arctic fox. Uh, we had for many years, we had a den with young puppies in town. And here you see how the, the mother has brought a dead gosling to the, to, to, to the young and learns them not only to eat them, but also to hide them for winter. So there's a lot of uh, hiding and normally when this puppy will make a hole and, and put the gosling in, then the mother comes and takes it out and brings it to another puppy. But it's very important for the foxes because in winter they have to survive on, uh, for some part on things they have stored during the summer. So the foxes have a big problem because they have to stay in the Arctic during winter. The geese go south and so it's not that severe, but for the foxes it's very severe and we have years in which many of the foxes simply die because the winter conditions are so complicated. They, it's a species which can very much cycle and here you can see how much of the goslings survived in, oh, sorry, in the diff uh, different years. And I had years in which there were no foxes and most of the goslings survived and years with foxes, and most of the goslings were eaten. So here on the picture, you see a, a common eider head in front, but behind that you see also a gosling, which is brought in by the mother. The Arctic fox is brownish in summer and white in winter. It changes fur. So looking at the whole uh, percentage of uh, surviving goslings, 100% all the goslings would survive, 0% all the goslings are eaten. And you can see there is a tremendous amount of variation between the years. Just some, some data, and I haven't filled it in until now, but you can see some years all of the goslings survive, some years all of the goslings are predated. Very big difference. But remember, these geese, they become uh, 18 to 20 years old. They have, um, uh, uh, after, when they are two years old, they can make a nest and they can produce five eggs every season. So five times 15 is 75 eggs. If they all would survive, then it would be an explosion of geese. So it's a simple calculation to understand that it's actually interesting that there is a lot of predation, but also there has to be a lot of predation, otherwise the world would explode with geese and they would ruin their own existence. More or less the geese bring food for the foxes to the Arctic. So what has happened with goose populations? The barnacle geese was very rare. In 1943, in the wintering areas in Scotland, there were only 243 geese. So a very low number. That uh, was a big concern. We, they didn't know in those years, I wasn't alive yet, but they didn't know in those years where those geese went in summer. Only in 1968, a Norwegian expedition banded some of the geese and found out that they, the population on Svalbard was linked to Scotland. But so they started protecting this population and hoped that it would in increase and it did with all these, these things also in the breeding areas, there were sanctuaries made and actually they increased quite well. This is a, a linear scale. Here on the right, you can see the total population in this flyway on a uh, logarithmic scale, 
which really means that it goes sky high. And while I uh, said, let's say it started in 1943 with 243 geese, at the moment we talk about 40,000 geese. So almost 200 times more geese in this flyway. Why did that increase so much? Basically because of agriculture in the wintering grounds at first. What the farmers did in Europe was actually starting fertilize the land with nitrogen. And this is what the farmer would put on his land in the different years from 1935 to 1995. And you see how the increase now it's actually around to 300 kilos per hectare, which is put as nitrogen on the ground. What happens with that is that the grass stays green most of the winter, but also that it is very high protein. This nitrogen is the plant changes it in protein. And so it does, um, it has very good winter conditions. So the increase in goose numbers is mainly by fertilization and protection. And this overspending of nitrogen actually also increases the amount of nitrogen in the atmosphere. And so at the moment we have in the Netherlands with uh, 60 kilograms of nitrogen falling from the air, even in the unfertilized nature reserves. It's really a big problem. So actually we have official problem now with the amount of nitrogen and much of our building construction and things like that is stopped simply because we don't take enough measures on uh, the, the nature conservation. But 60 kilos of hectare was the advice in the 50s and is now simply falling from the air. So this fertilization is not just local, it's everywhere. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so what has happened? has extended the period of high protein grasses and extended the period of the new population of gods in Sweden, which starts to increase quite some time and is now stabilized by predation by eagles. And in the, in the 80s, also in the Netherlands, it started. And remember, this is a logarithmic scale. So if you think it's, uh, it's not impressive, it really, if you would put it in a normal scale, it would go up, high up. And so in the Netherlands right now, we have the same population size as on Svalbard. Also in summer, around 40,000 geese. And the whole population in the Netherlands is about 800,000 geese in winter. Tremendous numbers. So what does this mean? And that was the nice thing now. Now I could compare barnacle geese in the north area of their breeding range and in the southern area of their breeding range. So we did a comparison from Svalbard and from the Netherlands. On both of these pictures here, the trees are just half a centimeter high. In the Netherlands, of course, you can see the trees are much bigger. It's really another place. But this area is also complete and eaten down by the number of geese which are grazing right now. So what we did was we looked at, uh, at their health by taking a blood sample and we did some tests on the blood. Simple tests like looking at the white blood cells of uh, smears, a uh, special type of white blood cells. And we did a test on the plasma to see how effective the plasma was with um, with lysis of red rabbit cells. And so these data we put in the graph here, this is on the our y axis, it's the amount of lysis. And on the uh, x axis, it's the white blood cell, the macrophage. And the number of samples in a certain area, in a, in a certain area in this graph is just presented by the red color. You can see in the Arctic, the immune activity is much less than in the temperate regions. There's clearly an issue there. We also see that in the temperate regions in the Netherlands, the goslings grow slower. So it can be because they have costs on the immune system, but it also can be that they uh, the night 
makes them to stop grazing for some time. And maybe that's also a problem. We don't know yet. But basically, the immune activity in the Arctic is less, probably because the Arctic has less pathogens. To bring a pathogen up there, you have to be healthy because you have to fly a long distance to get there. And only healthy birds can fly that long distance. So the pathogens are not always brought to the Arctic. And also in the temperate region, the geese are grazing in the same grassland the whole year, which also gives the, the possibility of reinfecting the goose. So we think those are the mechanisms which play a role over here. The Arctic is much cleaner in diseases than the, uh, our region. But to test that, we raised goslings. Here you see a student with a group of goslings which she, she raised. And this is in the, in the south, a PhD student who also had a group of goslings. And we compared those goslings. And actually what was the difference is that in the Netherlands, 12 out of 15 had infections, while in the Arctic, only two of the 15 had infections. There was a large variation of what kind of infections, but so we could see that certainly these geese, which were simply feeding in the Netherlands, were picking up much more, uh, much more diseases. So the reasons for migration, uh, to cut short, is that there's protein-rich grass, there is a full day of feeding, some years with fewer predators, and less risk for diseases. Of course, the disadvantage is the migration, which is unpredictable and dangerous, but the geese are adapted to that. They do it very well, this migration. But there is a new issue. The Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the world. So what the problem is, is that you can't, you don't know what's happening on, on the Arctic before you have been there. So what's the consequence of that? So we put on the ring, we put a so-called geolocator, a small computer which measures light. And we have to recatch the bird and we put the data in the computer. And then if we see the data, we can just uh, see day and night periods. And by analyzing the, um, the moment in which uh, the length of the day, we know how much north or, or uh, the geese are. And by analyzing the moment in which the sun uh, rises, we know which longitude the goose have. And we can calculate the position of the goose with a 200 meter accuracy. And this is a set of data which we collected already several years ago showing the migration of the geese. Basically, this in the middle panel is the traditional migration coming from the U from Scotland, moving to the Helgeland and in Norway. And all these R's are, the white R's are sightings of that goose. So then actually there's full light in the north and we can't see where the geese are anymore. But I mainly did the uh, geolocators on females. And when they start incubation, the female is the one who incubate, and then it gets dark again. So you can see here periods of incubation. Some of the geese are failed breeding. They leave the nest. Others, uh, I remove the geolocator and they still breed until the end. New strategies were emerging. First of all, the geese were starting to move further north. Climate change brought spring further north and they moved to uh, Westerholen and migrated over there. But there was also a group of geese, while there is no breeding population in the UK because of hunting, but still the, um, the geese stayed longer because the protein content was well enough. And then they migrated to Spitsbergen and were still able to, ra to breed. And we calculated earlier that it would be impossible, but actually climate change that also in the Arctic made it possible for them to feed when they arrived. Normally, so earlier they arrived in snow, and now there was just the tundra was gone, and that made a big difference. I'm just speeding up a little bit because the snow is disappearing. It is the, the dotted line is 0.4 days per year in which the snow is disappearing earlier in this data set. But mind you that the earliest date of snow dis disappearance was 2016. And the latest day of snow disappearance in this data set was 2014. So there's tremendous uh, variation, which makes it difficult to plan. But the overall trend is 0.4 days a year. So uh, we had these hatch dates. 
And if you look at when the tundra is snow free and when the hedge date is, it seems like there is a trophic match, mismatch, but actually that the geese don't react enough. But if you look a little bit better with the years now on the x-axis, you can see that the geese did hatch for 10 years at a more or less constant moment. Then suddenly they moved and from 2006 onwards, they stayed on another schedule for 10 years. And recently they have made another jump. And the dotted line in this data set is again, exactly the same line as the onset of the season. So really impressive how this has changed. And the importance of long data sets is also clear. If I would have only used my PhD, I wouldn't have been able to say anything about it. But so the geese did adapt in that timing. And it was really that individuals shifted before 2006 and after 2006, they are not, some of them are still on the YSX line, but most of them did come earlier. So the last paper I want to discuss with you is a, actually a, a paper with the effect of climate change on population size. Uh, Kate uh, Leighton Matthews uh, is a modeler and she analyzed uh, my 30 years of data in a model. And uh, I won't go into too much detail, but basically she looked factors which had an effect on the egg phase was spring onset. So when the snow disappears, uh, hatching was uh, better when there was uh, temperature uh, was high. And if there was a lot of rain, then the goslings didn't fledge that easy. And if there were a lot of foxes also. And then there was this adult population size. If there were more geese, they compete with on the food. And so that had also an effect on the survival of the goslings. To show a little bit what the data say is basically here, the spring onset means the first free day, it, they link together. The temperature links to the greening date. And actually there's a very interesting relation between the amount of precipitation <clears throat> and the grass biomass. And I think it's not the precipitation which causes it, but with a cloudy year, actually the light might be limiting. We haven't looked at that, but I think the light is the reason why this is a negative relation. And she also modeled the whole migration route and she found temperature uh, and population size in the winter area were important, precipitation in spring and the foxes in summer. And then if you look at, uh, at that in more detail, suddenly climate change is acting in a different way all around the migration route. So this is just uh, here it is temperature, also in the Arctic temperature plays some role for the hatching of the goslings but also precipitation is in two of the three areas an important factor. In the end, what is also important is that the models say that, adult, that the population size, the adult density, but also the total population density has an effect. And so far people were thinking that density dependence didn't exist in geese, but we clearly show that it does exist. <coughs> Where will this go? Sorry, I'm just a few minutes late, but I'm getting close to the end. The warming of the Arctic. It's very clear the breeding season is warming a lot. In the non-breeding season there, we found a trend with temperature, but there is no trend yet in the temperature in Scotland. So it does, there's a variation. While temperature in both areas is important, it act, it, the climate change acts differently. And then with these models, it's nice to analyze, but we haven't looked yet at this difference in hatch state and the consequences of it, the consequences of the migration route. We didn't look into the effect of the vegetation being changing over time, uh, just only at productivity of the vegetation. And then there are new, new kids on the block. We have more and more polar bears and there's a heavy predation it started in areas very remote, but at the moment actually also in Kongfjorden, there's an increasing amount of polar bears who come and predate on the eggs in spring. Here you see this happen. A polar bear comes to a breeding island and just is collecting the eggs. Uh, uh, Jauke Prop has made this video in, his, uh, in the wilderness area. And you see how it's counting minutes polar bear in the, in the colony and eggs taken. And if you would follow this, all these 3,000 eggs are eaten by the polar bear. He 
puts the egg on his feet, make presses and broken, and then eats the yolk from his pelt. And that's why the the uh, leg of a polar bear like that is very yellow. And in the meantime, you see the glaucous gull, the big white gulls walking also in between the nests, and they can swallow an egg as soon as the nest is free. So they just predate also a lot. And so in the end, none of the uh, none of the geese in this uh, uh, survive. So to see more of this, you can go to my website, arcticstation.nl, to learn more about what we're doing and uh, something maybe on the Arctic turn migration. And thank you for your attention. Well, many thanks, uh, Professor Martin. It was a fantastic lecture. I invite the... What is, I mean, there are uh, two ways people are watching. One on a live streaming and uh, on video, I mean, YouTube, which is uh, there are uh, more than 60 plus people there. And this is uh, the Google Meet window where uh, we have 41 people here. So those who wanted to raise questions, uh, please uh, type it on the screen and then uh, we will convey it to and uh, Martin will respond to it. Yes, Sunil, please. Yeah. It, uh, it, it depends a little bit on which pathogen. So basically, more and more, we have the idea that the animal, the bird flu is staying in the temperate region. And so the geese going to the Arctic rarely have bird flu. We haven't found it yet. But there is a little parasite, uh, which is uh, a toxoplasmosis, which is actually brought by the geese to the Arctic. And so there are some more parasites where the geese don't have much problem but they do bring it to the Arctic. So um, it's uh, both things are happening, but basically what we see in the geese is that there are not pathogens which affect themselves. But for instance, the toxoplasmosis might affect the Arctic foxes, which eat the geese and actually be, can become, uh, uh, make the foxes sick. So in that sense, there is an, uh, an interesting relation where more or less the geese might manage the fox population on the long run with this. So it might even be an adaptation. I don't know, this is a little bit speculative. But so there is movement, but also what is very important, thinking about the intestines, they are empty within one half hour. So they are flying their migration with empty intestines. So it's not that easy to bring the pathogens, many pathogens to the Arctic, but there are some specific examples which show that it can happen. Yeah, so they, they, they only, uh, or the turns, the turns, uh, oops, um, I've got data on that. Uh, I think three months, uh, uh, less than three months. So we have put geolocators also on the, on the Arctic turns and they fly to the Ar Antarctic and they go relatively fast. Also with the geese migrating, it's just uh, four or five days on the way back. Uh, they move much faster on the way south than on the way uh, north, the geese do, because they have this, this, they have this hopping, but the turns fly faster north than they do south. They do feed while flying south, and uh, um, they, 
Sometimes they have to wait a little bit in uh, before going to the Antarctic because the Antarctic is still midwinter. The turns which we gave geolocators in the Netherlands, they are uh, they get to South Africa in the middle of August, which is the wrong time to go to the Antarctic because it's much too cold there still. They need the melting ice also because that brings layers in the water which helps them catching their little prey. But uh, so they wait longer on that latitude and then they move to the Arctic a little bit later, let's say two months. Uh, so October, November, they start to move really to the Antarctic. Sorry, I didn't uh, completely hear it. Uh, Martin, it is, uh, the question is like, why all the geese jump off the cliff? Oh, oh. Yeah. There is there, there's a difference uh, with the barnacle geese. So they used to they used to nest on the bird cliff, um, and that's because uh, they were they couldn't defend their nest against predators. The pink-footed goose can, but the fox chase the foxes away. The barnacle goose can't. So they were when they were rare, they were all nesting on the bird cliff. But what happened actually on Svalbard is that people were shooting polar bears until 1972. And so what happened was that in the fjord system, there were no, um, there were no, fo no bears anymore when the population started to increase. And then the big jump the geese made was that they found all these islands which were free of bears where they could nest. So that's just a time window because what we see now is that their bears are coming back and eating the eggs of the geese on the islands. But so you have to remember, this is not, this is more or less going back to the old situation. The islands are not safe for polar bears. And before people were on Svalbard in such high numbers, before 1900, then there were bears in the fjord system. We just have a diff, uh, uh, we have the idea that the bears need to move on the ice. But actually what happened was that all the bears which came in the fjord were shot. So the remaining ones were living on the ice, but also were afraid of people. They were just, uh, which meant also that the bears didn't come back easily. So with the barnacle geese, they became protected. They came used to people and slowly they became close to people as Nialesund. I went to Nialesund because that was in those days, the only place where you could see approach molten geese. All the rest, they are very afraid. They don't make a sound anymore. Similar process with the polar bears. They are not hunted anymore. And slowly, the first generation is just afraid of people. But slowly they learn. And what we have seen in the Alessund is first mothers with young bears. And last year, it was a lot of big bears. That those were the young bears who were raised in the fjord and are not afraid of us anymore. So what is very important to understand is that it's not only more polar bears, but the polar bears are more dangerous for people because they are not afraid of us anymore. And that's something we really have to take into account. I have uh, I have one yeah. uh, question. Like uh, it seems the population of uh, the geese have exploded like anything. It has become a huge number. So is it because you know, like you actually you said some uh, results, like the warming and the melting is taking away the ice cover on the tundra, and the expanding tundra is giving a lot of food or uh, the protein-rich grass, which is uh, being uh, eaten by the, the geese and they are uh, multiplying in large numbers. Uh, is that right? So warming basically has got a positive effect on the goose population, I say. 
yes, more or less the the warming made space for the geese to become such a big uh, population. And that is in a sense interesting. I went specifically to Svalbard because it's an island. And I wanted to study how the increasing number of geese would become a problem and would be more or less regulated by density dependence. That's why I went there, because if I would have gone to the barnacle geese in Russia, there was always something on the, behind the horizon, which I couldn't study. So I thought bar, uh, uh, Svalbard is the right place. And we had even, there were calculations from the Wildfire Trust saying 17,000. There is not more place than 17,000 geese on Svalbard. But in those days, they thought the geese would never come so close to the town. They also didn't, uh, there's also more areas and there's more grass production. And even in the east of Svalbard, there's more fee food. So basically what has happened with climate change is simply more food availability. But then suddenly, of course, predation comes in. And in the modeling, which I showed, we only have the foxes. But now at this moment, it is the polar bear too. And if that continues, then actually it might completely Balance. destroy the colony mm -hmm. because uh, and, 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 and so again, big changes, but more or less it brings the goose back to the situation they were in history uh, 60 years ago. So in that sense also, it's just a, a kind of cycle. And, uh, but, but, uh, but uh, yeah, interesting to see how all these things interact. And that's actually why, why I love my, my job. Uh. Yes, yes, Sunil, please. Uh, how, what affects the go this ecosystem? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what I, what I show what I showed you before is actually that we have a tremendous effect on the increasing geese simply because what we do in the wintering areas, we have removed the the limits to the goose population simply by fertilizing the land. The geese can go everywhere, and we stopped in many countries. We stopped hunting in the Netherlands. If you are a hunter, you're a criminal. In Denmark and Norway, if you are a hunter, you're a true man. So there's also nationalist <laughs> things which which makes it different. But on the other hand, it's just it, it uh, if the population was small, and if you shoot ten goose, then it had, it had a tremendous effect. Now, when the population is big and you have an equal number of hunters, then still you you, you can shoot hundred geese, and it doesn't have an effect anymore because the population is bigger. So it's more or less, it has escaped the effect of predation in the wintering areas by humans. Uh, and, and now, um, uh, uh, and, and then we have increased the amount of food to such a level that we do see now that the amount that they are competing with each other. Even in this green world, they have just, there is an effect of density dependence on the wintering population. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think uh, the remaining questions could be. You can. Uh, we will share the email of uh, those who wish to ask uh, because he's uh, a real expert with uh, you know decades of field experience in uh, Arctic and in the geese population. So anybody who wants to write to him, you can. Uh, we will share the mail ID of Martin later and you can interact with him and uh, now i invite uh, dr sunil uh, to propose word of thanks Oh, okay. I, uh, that's interesting, but actually the geese learn 
they learn their migration route during the first trip with their parents. I told you already earlier, and you probably know that when they come out of the nest, they learn what is their mother and father. And then the rest of their first year, they will accept even humans or dogs as their parent. The same is with the migration route. They fly with their parents and they learn the route and will fly it the rest of their, their life mainly. And so if I raised goslings, they, I couldn't learn them the route. So there was no opportunity. We have had, we have, uh, there was an experiment done with snow geese and the snow geese stayed on the tundra until it froze simply because they didn't know how to migrate. So they learn it from the parents, which is a very interesting fact because if you have to change your behavior because of evolution, that some die and some survive, that takes long, but learning is fast. So in that sense, they are really adapted to a variable environment and they can respond to it because, and the best way to behave in basically is do the same as your parents because your parents were successful in raising you. So just mimic what your parents say and you have a head start. Maybe a lesson for all of us.
Thank you, Cyril. Just one second. Uh, our sincere thanks to Dr. Morten Ecker. Uh, I think Cyril just missed out. I mean, I'm I'm very sure he just missed out. He is not intentional. It is. Uh, we are so thankful to you because uh, an ambitious uh, presence in, especially in this particular talk, is very very valuable because they are an authority on uh, Arctic migratory bird. Uh, their initiative is uh, doing great research all over the globe. And sending a representative to this talk is uh, a great honor from AMBI. And we convey our sincere thanks and appreciation to the presence of uh, Dr. Morten Ecker and his uh, you know, opening remarks. Thank you, Morten. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Yes, we will uh, now wind up the meeting. Let's hope, I mean, we have some more speakers lined up. Uh, for uh, future uh, talks, we will have uh, those ones uh, soon. Maybe we are spacing it two weeks' time, probably, so that uh, we get refreshed and then uh, come to the lectures. Thank you, everyone, sir. Thank you, Ravi, sir. Thank you, Rahul, sir. Dr. Krishnan, everyone listening as yes.